Welcome to the third in the series of CURF seminars. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Australian National University recognizes that it is situated on country for which the Nambri Ngunnawal people have been custodians for many centuries, indeed many millennia, and on which they have performed age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation, and renewal. We acknowledge their living culture and unique role in the life of this region and offer our deep appreciation for their contribution to and support of our academic enterprise. So as I mentioned, this is the third in our series of uh, CURF seminars, and this one wins the award, I think, for the best title so far. CURF, CURF, and CURF. I think it should be a menu for a sustainable regional future menu. I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague, Professor Barbara Norman from the University of Canberra, who will be giving the seminar tonight. Professor Norman is the Foundation Chair and Head of Discipline in Urban and Regional Planning at UC. She is Life Fellow and past National President of the Planning Institute of Australia, a member of National Coast and Climate Change Council, the Regional Development Australia Fund Advisory Panel, the National Stakeholder Advisory Group to the CSRO Climate Adaptation Flagship, and also Deputy Chair, Regional Development Australia, ACT. Professor Norman is also co-director of Canberra Urban and Regional Futures, CURF, which is sponsoring this seminar, and she's an adjunct professor with us here at the Australian National University. She has extensive experience in the public sector at all levels of government, including senior executive roles in the ACT government. Professor Norman advises the public and private sector in Australia and has strong international linkages with Asia, Europe, and, and the USA. Her research interests include coastal planning, of course that's been in the news right, uh, lately, particularly in, in the Australian if you've read some of their pieces on that. Sustainable cities, urban and regional planning, climate change adaptation and urban governance. She was awarded, awarded an Australian Centenary Medal for her contribution to the community through urban and regional planning. So I think there's no one better positioned uh, to give us a lecture on a, sustain, a sustainable re regional future. So over to you, Barbara. Thank you very much, Will, and uh, may I acknowledge Will as co-director of CAF for being such a uh, pleasant and uh, uh, enjoyable uh, co-director with CAF. It's our third, uh, third lecture tonight, and the attendance is terrific, so I think it uh, bodes well for CAF and its future. So there's quite a lot of ground to cover tonight, and uh, some of my students are here tonight, and I think they may be able to enact revenge because I just assessed them this afternoon on timing of their presentations. So if I go over time, I think they may be giving me a mark as well. Um, thank you also to ANU for uh, hosting this and uh, for all of you coming out on a actually quite warm August night, which is uh, a refreshing change. So surf, turf and curf. I like the title too. <laughs> Surf, Curf and Curf, obviously surf, uh, coastal planning, if you think about our region from Kosciuszko to the coast, uh, that's about uh, coastal planning, which is a particular expertise of mine, uh, turf, the hinterland, and Curf, Canberra, urban and regional futures. <coughs> Very much about joining the dots between the, that, uh, the Canberra, our national capital, our hinterland and our coast, with a regional focus. I will come back to Canberra towards the end. I'll actually be starting with a national, with a national level. So the outline of this talk tonight, so uh, firstly to look at the national policy framework, as I said in the flyer that went out, if, uh, if you uh, were remotely interested in the 2011 federal budget, uh, there was a new national level policy that was stated there for the first time in many years. Uh, very much probably I would argue the first time um, particularly recognising climate change in this form uh, f since, since Federation. Uh, certainly there was the Whitlam years, there was Brian Howe's years with the uh, Department of Housing and Regional Development. Uh, Keating put his toe in briefly and then lost office. And uh, then there's been the re-emergence quite recently. Also in the federal budget there was regional policy back on the agenda in a different form under Simon Crean and uh, climate change uh, an emerging climate change policy under the Minister Combat. Uh, then I'll be looking at some of the regional responses and uh, local actions, some of the challenges and opportunities for the Canberra region, the current and future contribution of CURF, 
And I will be arguing through this, I hope, uh, reasonably well, but you could challenge me, and I love questions, so let's get to that at the end, about, uh, I think, the need and the timeliness now for a regional spatial plan for the Canberra region. So in national urban policy, I guess some of you uh, would be familiar with this context. I know there's some uh, uh, planners here tonight. Others would think, why on earth is the Commonwealth involved in national urban policy? Um, often people come across urban planning uh, when their neighbour's doing an extension or something's happening in their neighbourhoods and sometimes it's not a very happy experience. But in fact, what we're looking at here is a much larger picture. Uh, this country is growing in population. It's uh, growing in terms of coverage by urban development. Our cities are expanding. And so the argument here is this country now is at a point where national urban policy is of national interest. And that's been reflected in the budget this year. Up here is a diagram that's taken uh, from the National Urban Policy Statement, courtesy of the Major <coughs> Cities Unit. Uh, Dota Equin heads that up and was coming tonight until just a little while ago and couldn't due to a family issue, but uh, has been very supportive uh, in uh, preparing this presentation, supportive to me. Uh, here you see a context. Uh, the diagram, my only comment is that they've taken what I think is a fairly old-fashioned diagram on triple bottom line, which often people still use today, uh, but I think takes us to possibly the lowest common denominator of trade-offs. I hope we're transitioning to the other diagram you could see there, which is uh, effectively arguing, or essentially arguing, no environment, no society, no society, no economy. In other words, the economy is not a function of itself, Society is not a function of itself, well dependent on the planet. I think that's a much uh, clearer way of looking at things. It certainly clarifies my thinking and I hope we're heading towards that direction. The positive thing about this diagram is for the first time that I can remember, we're actually starting at a national level to link sustainable population uh, policy with national urban policy with regional policy and I think that's a very big step forward. Just a little, little bit more detail on the national level policy. I think the other big step forward is the criteria that you can see particularly down the column on your right. Uh, many of those terms you will have seen before in terms of our national policy, but there's a couple there that you would not have seen before, I suspect. Uh, adaptability, possibly in climate policy, but not in urban policy, and resilience. Again, in others domains, possibly in social policy, but not in urban policy. So I think, again, that's a big step forward. Uh, integration, engagement, value for money, of course, Treasury has their say, and efficiency. But I think what's happening here is it's starting to be triple bottom line. I think the basics for the national urban policy framework are there, but it's only the beginning. Because when you look at the national urban policy statement, uh, it's not really a criticism. I support what they've done but there's not a lot much more than what you see up on that diagram now. So I hope that the building blocks um, are put more in place uh, in next year's budget. Parallel to this, and I acknowledge Tony Carmichael here tonight as First Assistant Secretary of the Department of Regional Australia, Regional Development and Local Government. Uh, parallel with this has been the policy development under Simon Crean as Minister for Regional Australia. Now, anyone who knows Simon's background, uh, regional is sort of almost synonymous with his name. It's not partisan politics, it's just something that he's been involved in for a very long time. And so he's taken up this uh, agenda with gusto and uh, seems to be a kind of reborn minister out there at the moment, giving big speeches around regional policy. The big step forward here that I observe, and there are pluses and minuses, but I'll say the positives first, is that it is uh, at least consciously triple bottom line. If you go back to regional policy over the last, since the 1970s, it's had a very strong regional development focus. And at least, and then it started to have a social focus under Brian Howe, and now it has a triple bottom line focus with the environment agenda. And uh, if you've been to any recent uh, forums, you actually see now two ministers coming together around carbon pricing at the regional level with uh, both Simon Green <coughs> and Greg Combat. So we are starting to get some of those issues joining those dots. I'm reluctant to use that phrase in a way because I suggested it to the department and now every time the minister speaks, that's what he says, he's joined the dots. So uh, some Commonwealth bureaucrats, I think, want to lynch you at this point. 
climate change. So I'm not going through a dissertation on every policy, but I'm just giving you a snapshot of each of these main streams right now. Climate change, well, you'd have to have had your head under a pillow if you haven't uh, heard about this issue uh, uh, recently, and obviously uh, Will Stafford here has played a lead role in this. Uh, the carbon price package, uh, clearly out there for debate and discussion. The Climate Commission, which is the panel of scientists that are out there to uh, uh, share knowledge and uh, capacity building in many ways with the community around climate change. The Coast and Climate Change Council, which I'm a member of, and uh, we're having our own issues around sea level rise, and I was quoted in that article in The Australian in the weekend, uh, where a scientist has um, uh, come out said the sea level's actually going down. So there's started some debate. And climate change, which I don't agree with, by the way, and climate change adaptation program, which really recognises what the scientists say, that we are past the tipping point at this point. So as planners, which is my profession, we need to start planning for climate change now. Two reports that you see up there, the critical decade, they're the two most recent reports that I can see, and also the supplementary report around risk. Now, you might see debate in the, amongst the shock jocks in the media right now, but behind the scenes, let me tell you, there's very serious work going on around the risks to do with climate change, and particularly to do with coastal inundation and sea level rise. And at the federal level, it's around uh, national uh, critical infrastructure. And so often you hear, around, hear uh, debates about housing, but in many ways, I think that's possibly one of the easiest issues we can deal with over time. Some of the most difficult issues are the lumpy bits of infrastructure out there, like uh, major airports. How do we plan for those? How do we deal with Sydney Airport? How do we deal with Cairns Hospital that's less than one metre above sea level? Those critical social, physical infrastructure that have 50, 60, 100 year lifespans. That's what we should be concerned with, in my view, today. So planning for extreme weather events. Well, we have had our fair share, haven't we? And today, uh, I think the interim report on the Brisbane floods came down this afternoon with uh, many recommendations and the Premier of Queensland immediately accepted all of them, as you could imagine she would have. Planning for extreme weather events. <coughs> well, being a coastal planner primarily, uh, I often talk about sea level rise. But bushfires in Victoria, I was living in Victoria at the time, absolutely you know, dramatic. Uh, the buckling of uh, the railway lines during that period of time, so infrastructure. And then what do we do with places like the Gold Coast? And you can see, and the interesting thing I think about this, uh, this uh, mix of slides here is this is by the Insurance Council of Australia. Now again, the debate might be out there in the media around climate change, but just like the federal government behind the scenes, the insurance industry, who have lost a lot of money in this last year, very, very focused on this. So how do you step back? We talk about coastal retreat. How do we step back the Gold Coast? And if you know anything about what's there with the Gold Coast, there's a whole lot of water behind those buildings. And uh, as I discussed with my students, also the ability to adapt uh, varies. And you can almost class, if you look at the demographics of the Gold Coast now, you can almost class that as a vertical uh, retirement village. So the capacity to adapt and respond in an emergency varies and we need to be conscious of that. So planning for climate change. Now I'm not a photographer, although increasingly with my iPhone I'm becoming very interested in it. <laughs> so and I and I burden all my friends with my photos, so but they're very polite about it. So this is um, so this is uh, uh, a photo of uh, Byron Bay. Now this is I would and I have to be careful because this is in court and uh, the very wealthy landowners involved and they are not um, averse to suing people making public comment on this issue. So I'll choose my words carefully. Let's pretend this is somewhere else, maybe. And, <laughs> and <laughs> landowners, <laughs> landowners have taken, yeah, it's taken the, you know, the law into their own hands. Now, really, you know, is that a good solution for Australia? You know, our entire coastline, is that a good solution? And New South Wales, in response to this, prepared some legislation and on the front of the legislation, which has now been put aside, I think sensibly, for more discussion, is sandbags. The notion of this New South Wales legislation is every landowner gets a set of sandbags. And there's a storage area in the local park. No, no matter if you're 80 years old, you know, going, I mean, it's just crazy. So 
I think that we have to be uh, uh, working very quickly and very effectively right now, again, about how we manage our coastline in the context of extreme weather and planning for climate change. The other photo here has been taken by a friend of mine, David Tatnell, who is a photographer, and I think it tells, uh, uh, tells me a lot anyway that at the local level, again, while all this discussion is going on in the media, at the local level, people are making decisions, pragmatic decisions. And here we've got an example where just, you know, pragmatically, should I build this, rebuild this walkway, this jetty one metre high now, in case there is sea level rise, or should I not? Well, clearly this person's made a pragmatic decision and said, well, the marginal cost of doing that right now, as Stern has argued, as Ross Garneau has argued, is minimal compared to having to replace that down the track. And so we're beginning to see local people taking action around infrastructure on the ground, and I find that uh, more informing many, in many ways than uh, many of the articles I read. Mean. So the carbon price package, uh, I won't go through this, uh, you know about it, you've seen it on the ads, it's there, and, but I think the 330 million I'm quite interested in <coughs> for low carbon communities. And I'll be very interested in how that uh, pans out, not Higatoni and others particularly, but I think that that's an opportunity and I hope that fund grows. Social considerations around this, and still we're at the national level and we'll drop down to the regional level soon, shortly. I think we're only just beginning to have this conversation. I know there's some good research happening through the National um, Climate Change Adaptation Facility based in Griffith. <coughs> I know that there's uh, some uh, good uh, discussion happening in the community about these issues, and I'm sure the Climate Commission and their forums, community forums, have been exposed to some of these issues. But social equity is a really important consideration. And uh, when we're linking, uh, which I hope I'm doing in this talk, uh, regional developments with climate change, with national level policy, the social equity considerations, I think, is one of those things, one of those glues that joins the dots. I think that social equity considerations, the ability for people to be able to come through these large and significant changes, in other words, that idea about resilience, is something we should be focusing on. I mentioned adaptive capacity, that will be variable, and in all the extreme weather events we've had recently, we've seen evidence of that. Human behaviour. Now, Graham Pearman, sort of, as many of you would know, was a leading scientist, still is a leading scientist, but he's decided to talk to uh, uh, psychologists instead now because he thinks that's possibly where the answer is. I mean, it's our behaviour that's causing these things, our behaviour. So I had a great illustration of this when I was at the National Sea Change uh, Conference uh, discussion in Byron Bay uh, last year. And uh, there was a tsunami warning. And so what was the response? Everybody went to the coast. <laughs> what an insane response. Everybody went to the coast. So, uh, so I just, that again was very illustrative to me that we have a long way to go still in terms of behaviour. So uh, if it had been real, it would have been very serious. So human behaviour. And uh, an argument that I've been not very successfully yet, but I'm going to continue to argue. At the very least in this country, we should be mapping where existing urban settlements is, where our future urban growth areas are with our climate risk. We haven't done it. So we cannot yet identify where those areas are at most risk. Where are the most people living, for example, put simply, and where is the highest risk? And where do they intersect? Surely that might be a good beginning to the uh, place to be starting our uh, investigations. So responding to extreme weather and climate change, uh, developing new pathways. Uh, some of this language you see, it comes in and out of vogue, I know, but I think it's probably a good way. It's, I find it a good way to think about things. I think there's some shared learnings coming out right now. Uh, the Royal Commission in the Victorian, to the Victorian bushfires, the floods in uh, Brisbane, uh, some work that I've been involved in and others around cities and climate change. And now the OECD looking at uh, green growth and uh, you know, the notion of investing in the environment as a driver of future of the economy is actually a sensible thing to be talking about, which is, of course, what, partly what carbon pricing is about. So let's bring all this back to home. How do we, are we connecting the dots or not back in Canberra? 
Now, it's always easy to give these speeches overseas or interstate. It's always hard to give it in the low patch. So this is a challenge, as the, uh, one of the reporters asked me yesterday. Uh, ACT set to breach border. That was on the front page, I think, just a few days ago. Proposed development on the edge. Uh, at the same time, Kuba Manara Express, one hour down the road, trying to retain its population, accepting grants of $7,000 from the New South Wales government to try and retain its population. Now, there is a railway that goes between the ACT, Canberra, and Cooma, which we've closed. Does that make sense? Now, I lived in Victoria during the last 10 years. I was in Canberra, went to Victoria for 10 years, came back. But anyway, that's another story. The, I saw the transformation in Victoria, investing in railways, uh, productivity in that, return, economic return in that, the regional growth in Ballarat, Bendigo, La Trobe, Geelong, absolutely fantastic transformation. We haven't even started to have that discussion here, and I will be arguing that tonight. That's an example of why we need a regional spatial plan. We don't even have an integrated transport plan for this region, for freight, for public transport, for passengers. You know, we are about to celebrate our 100th birthday. What are we doing? We can do better. So what can we learn from elsewhere in trying to do better? Innovative regional responses. I've put some examples up here because I thought it was incumbent on me to do that. The first one is Geelong 21. I still think that's probably the best example in the country. Some of my colleagues in regional Australia and others, I actually smiled the other day when one of them said, uh, oh, that's a bit old, that's old, Barbara. You know, we've moved on since then. If they had any idea of how difficult it was for that community to get that together, the reason why I argue Geelong 21, and I encourage you to look it up on the web, the reason I argue it's probably still the best example in the country is it started from a meeting just like this. It started from a meeting of a mixture of community, academic, research, politicians and business who said, the issues that we are dealing with today transcend local government boundaries. The issues we are dealing with today, like transport, housing affordability, climate change, and regional development, or sustainable regional development, or green growth, if you like to call it, transcend local boundaries. Why don't we actually work together? They argued, and so what they did, the state government said, oh, don't be ridiculous and go away. They weren't interested. But they just kept going, and they built it up, and they built it up. And now it's a very, very strong, robust, I think excellent example of a regional spatial plan and has now been adopted by the state government from the bottom up and I think it has great strength. The next one is the Sydney Coastal Councils around coasts and climate change. I'll put these, I won't go through them all because of time. Uh, the next one is the South East region, started off as the Western Port Greenhouse Alliance and is now is the South East uh, Melbourne Climate Change Alliance. Again, these are voluntary groupings, and this is my main point, voluntary groupings of local governments that have come together. It's nothing to do with top-down, voluntarily coming together. Now, local government never comes together voluntarily, but this is what we're seeing right around the country, and I've taken examples right around the country. So the next example is in Perth, <coughs> or south of Perth, from Mandra to Esperance. Nine councils have come together very recently, the most recent example of this coalition to work together on issues of mutual interest. And then finally, uh, the 55 Regional Development Australia <coughs> Committees that have been established by the federal government and uh, just, uh, just produced, each of them have produced a regional plan. So there's some examples of leading practice and things that we can, examples that we can look at for this region. So how are we going? So I thought I'd go back to the Y plan. Actually, really enjoyed putting this talk together. I hope you enjoyed it too. 19, 1967 to 2011. So I went back to the Y plan and I thought, did they take a regional approach? Or did they actually look, those people, when, we, when it was a, a national capital run by the national government? And yes, they did. Well, at least they looked over the border. Now, if you move to the next diagram, and this is not a criticism to Chief Minister, I've got my two representatives here who I, I acknowledge. It's just the way it's depicted. And you could be excused for thinking sea level rise has taken on new dimensions all the way to the <laughs> national capital. 
But this is the Capital Works Program. And is there any recognition that there's something over the border? None. Now, I know it's not ACT's responsibility or their jurisdiction, but I really would encourage somehow for next year, both sides, because I'm sure if I went to the New South Wales government diagram, there'd be a hole in the middle called <laughs> ACT. So I think what we need to do is start to at least, I mentioned transport before, wouldn't it be helpful if we at least had an integrated capital works program for the ACT, for the capital region from Kosciuszko to the coast? Even if we just mapped that at the beginning, we'd have some basic uh, fundamentals to work from in terms of our future. So then I had a look at the regional news. That was great fun. So this was last week. And I found it really interesting because, you know, in all my experience and my work and my research, you know, the issues that I've come up with are transport, housing, climate change, and what's there? Transport, climate change, housing, same in the regional news. So there is actually some correlation, which I found quite heartening, and of course Indigenous, which I haven't mentioned uh, today. And especially on the coastal environment, we have a great deal of work to do there. So regional news, so the region, so the community is interested in these issues, is my point. Not just academics, not just business, not just politicians, but the community is interested. And that's right around the region that I've taken those, those examples. So what's happening in the region? Now, I've talked about climate change and transport and those other issues. I think there's actually a more serious issue, and this is where I think we can do better. I was at Eurobadala uh, very recently with my students on a coastal planning course, uh, and a couple of them here tonight. And Eurobadala made a presentation to the students, a very good presentation, and really made the point that, yes, the national capital is there, yes, we're part of this region, but there's a huge social economic disparity between what's happening in some parts of our region and what's happening in the national capital. We talk about a patchwork economy, I've been thinking we've got a patchwork region, and that's where we can get it. Somehow, after 100 years, we must work out a way, I think, and maybe it's through a public transport system, maybe it's as simple as that to the coast for our, for our youth. Because I think it is inexcusable for just down the road in Yorubadala, where there's 20% higher youth unemployment. And so I think that uh, um, it is incumbent upon you, me, all of us, civic leaders, to try and bridge that gap. Again, through a regional spatial plan, it can make a contribution, it can't solve all those problems. At the local level, we're not short of plans. And you might think it's ironic that I'm suggesting we have another one, but that's another have that conversation. We're not short of local plans, but we are short <laughs> on regional action. Uh, no integrated transport strategy, no integrated settlement strategy, no regional response to climate change, and I could go on. No education strategy, collectively, between our two fine universities, for this university. So, opportunities through a spatial plan. What is a spatial plan, you might ask me, which is fair enough. Um, I see a regional <laughs> spatial plan as uh, a spatial spatial approach to uh, dealing with issues that cross the boundaries. And in this context, particularly local government boundaries, but also central boundaries. Long tradition of this in Europe, <laughs> although change of government in the UK has just abolished them. Uh, there we are. And so, uh, but a regional spatial plan, long tradition in Europe. In fact, ev in fact the uh, European Union requires every nation to have a national spatial plan. Uh, we're a long way from that, and I hope we see one one day. But uh, a regional spatial plan, again, about not joining the dots. I, so I prefer to say making the connections to make a difference. Transport and infrastructure, clearly, public transport in this region has to improve. Rapid public transport, preferably, oh, be bold to you, rail. I don't know if anyone heard Tim Fisher this morning on AM, he was fantastic. And he's just published a book about the 21st century and, and transport. And he's really arguing uh, very strongly for investment in rail right through this country. And I've just been over in Europe and I've been through China. When I came back, I was just struck so much. We are so far behind on this agenda. And yet it's so obvious to people overseas. They look at our country and say, why haven't you got rapid rail down the eastern seaboard? It's a no-brainer. 
And uh, Tim Fisher answered this question really well this morning. Uh, the reporter asked on AM, uh, uh, so why would it be any more affordable today than it was 10 years ago, Tim? He said, that's not the question to ask. The question to ask is this, do you want a 10 lane highway going all the way up the seaboard or not? Wouldn't it be better to have rapid rail? Well, I think that's a better way of looking. The Canberra region, this is the region that uh, we've adopted for CAF. It's also an Australian capital region. And I just thought I'd better put a map up as a camera. So what do I mean by a sustainable capital region for here? Now, I thought I'd have a look at some of the regional plans under the RDA process. And this has been compiled by the Inland Regional um, uh, Development uh, uh, Group. And you can see in a tangible way, which is why I like this slide and they lent this to me, uh, a tangible way, lots of things are happening. You know, lots of things are happening about a clean, green, resilient regional future right now. And I think we need to know that and be heartened by that because I think there's enormous potential. These are the three regional plans if you're interested in. One for the southern inland, one for the far south coast, and one for the ACT. The ACT is always is an anomaly, isn't it? Yeah, so we're the only RDA in the whole country that has one for the equivalent of a state or a territory. Um, Regional Development Australia have heard me say this, so they won't be upset when I say, I actually think we just need one RDA possibly for the ACR region. That's, that's a sustainable regional future. So uh, this is where um, I'll make my uh, beginnings of what uh, my recommendations about what I think should happen in, Canberra, in the Canberra region. Firstly, investment in rapid transit, making the connections of shifting freight and passengers from road to rail, a priority. Secondly, an urban development program that builds upon the current settlement pattern and maintains the spaces in between green we are different, let's retain that difference, let's not go down the path of every other city in this country for agriculture, for biodiversity and for climate change adaptation particularly. A regional capital works program I mentioned before that underpins a green resilient future and green growth and being in a university, of course, a transformative education research program to support a sustainable urban a regional future. So we have an urban and regional program for the first time in 100 years at the University of Canberra. fantastic and I'm the foundation chair and I feel it's a great privilege and honour to have that role. And I plan to be uh, around for a while. This other part of that, of course, is climate change. We have the Climate Institute at ANU, which is just uh, you know, recognised as an international leader in this field. So we have the ingredients to build this. We also have all the other researchers that are here that are starting to be part of CURF, I know, and to build this sort of, these connections. So, but we need investment. We need investment in these fields considerably. The research, investment in urban and regional research in this country is infinitesimal. And yet one of the biggest issues in this country is expanding cities. And I would, I possibly, although Will can correct me if you like, the investment, relative investment compared to medical health, and I don't want to upset any doctors here, <coughs> Uh, is in climate change is also infinitesimal, relatively speaking. So we do need to be making that change. So what is CAF? Coming down, surf, turf and CAF. Some of you will know about CAF. This is our uh, third uh, seminar. Uh, we're nearly uh, one year old, so we're very young. We're a year old in November. Uh, we think it's an innovative platform for joining the dots, for making the connections for this region. Uh, we think it, uh, we hope that it has uh, a great future with all of you. So uh, two universities have come together, which is a great step forward to establish this and to build those uh, relationships. It does aim to be a collaborative regional response and it arose out of a series of discussions where a number of us kept meeting at different places and then at the particular meeting in Adelaide we met and we said, well, <coughs> this is fine, but what are we actually doing for our part of the world? Why, why don't we, as the two universities in Canberra, start making a contribution to our region and how we can improve what's happening here? So at the very, at the, uh, I'm going backwards here, uh, co-directors, uh, colleague Professor Will Stafford and myself, turning chats to important people there. 
<laughs> and have principles and themes. Uh, Will and I wrote a paper very recently and presented it. I presented it in uh, Bonn uh, with uh, Bob Webb, who's there as well, uh, from the Climate Institute. And uh, it caused us to, at this early stage, to write down what curve is. So it caused us to think about what the principles are. And uh, with the curve team, uh, we had already developed the research themes. <coughs> but I think, interestingly, the first principle we ended up with was trust. Because to share knowledge and to build partnerships, I think there is nothing more important than trust. And once you lose it, it's very hard to get it back. So trust is something that uh, certainly the people involved in the Curve team is something we're all committed to. And I hope we can build on that because I think there's a really important message. If we are going to solve these complex or some people call wicked problems, we are going to have to come out of our silos. It does feel uncomfortable. We are going to have to share intellectual property. That's like against the law in academia. We are going to have to make these connections. So we're going to have to be a little brave here. And I think, but I think the benefits will be uh, exponential. We're not just about research, we're also supporting education. And uh, uh, this was a, uh, uh, our coastal planning course uh, on the New South Wales coast just uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it's my students uh, with my colleague Bill Ma, who's at the University of Canberra uh, in the Yurubadala Council, future, future politicians there, looking uh, very, very engaged and uh, on the beach. And uh, clearly we had a very reward, rewarding week, although it rained six days out of six. So, so uh, feedback might be good on the course, but it won't be on the weather. Um, Engineering sustainable systems at the same time uh, here with uh, Barry Newell and Katrina Proust, uh, uh, Will and uh, with some support from me, but principally Will, put this document together about in the North Canberra and it's about transformative change. Again, that's uh, an example. We're not uh, nailing ourselves to the recommendations at this point, are we? It's, a, it's the beginning of a conversation. It's another way to start stimulating our thinking locally. And that's what universities are meant to be doing, you know. I think that's what we're here for. And so, uh, one of the reasons we're here for. And so this is now the, um, the basis of the for third year and master's students for this semester at the Australian National University as their case study. So that's a real partnership. Curf, uh, people keep asking us, is this a research institute? No. It's a platform. No. What's that? And so, so we kind of had to start to define it. And so we see it as something that adds value over and above what research institutes traditionally do. So the words integration, synthesis and transformation are really the key <coughs> words that have developed out of that conversation. What's coming up? Uh, an agenda, 25th and 26th, the regional symposium in partnership with the Department of Regional Australia down at Batemans Bay. A CURF partnership with the ACT uh, Directorate of Environment and Sustainable Development has just been signed off, where Will and I will be giving advice to that uh, directorate uh, over the next 12 months on some of the big issues. Uh, spatial plan, <coughs> climate change, transport. So that's a very exciting opportunity. Uh, a regional profile is being built. There is nowhere at the moment to go anywhere to actually look at what this region's about, if you want to. Now, whether you're in the community, whether in politics, in business, or in research. And so we're beginning to build that regional profile, and we hope it will be very useful. I've mentioned the Inner North Canberra Transformation Project, 2013, and I'm hoping that this meeting tonight is the commencement of a process to start developing an integrated regional spatial plan for 2013 for this region. If you're interested in CURF, it's the CURF website, and I encourage you to, uh, to have a look. Now finally, just before I finish, there's uh, another hat that I wear, which is a judge, uh, so I can't discuss it, but you know, it's increasingly <coughs> have those roles these days. Capathetical. And so if you're interested, if you in design, architecture, sustainability, or you want to get a team together, I encourage you, it's a hundred thousand dollars prize. Uh, there's the honour, of course. <coughs> And uh, the, uh, it's open for entry now. And I think it says entry is closed uh, 31st of January 2012. So I really do encourage you, students, academics, all walks of life, put together an entry and see what you can do. See if you can make a difference. So that's 
So I've started at the national level, I've gone to the regional level, I've looked at the local level, started to try and make the join the dots, and I absolutely love this cartoon. And I thank you for listening and happy to answer any questions. period of time now for questions, so uh, Barbara's happy to take any questions that you have out there. Jenny? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm Dr. Jenny Goldie. Um, the particular hat I'm wearing tonight is uh, President of ACTP Coyle, and um, I really support everything you've said on transport and getting freight and people on from road onto to rail, but you don't, you haven't mentioned once P Coyle, and as far as I can see, uh, we're likely to have a crisis with peak oil and rising oil prices before we have climate change, even though we have seen some extreme weather events which are probably a result of climate change. And I, I, this is not so much a question, but I'm really just urging Kerf to address the urgency of rising oil prices. Um, I went to the talk by Mark Kelly and Kuma the other day, and um, he's talking about the development of biodiesel from algae, from power stations and so on, which is terrific, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. And <coughs> yet we really are um, facing the likelihood of um, very high oil prices. Um, very soon, which is going to, before these alternatives are developed, which is really going to throw a spanner in the work of existing transport. And I'm wondering whether it's possible to uh, convey some <laughs> the urgency in developing a plan uh, about the surrounding high oil prices, which are likely to occur in the next year or so. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't disagree with anything you've just said. I was, could have given a lecture almost on every slide I put up tonight, so it was a bit like skating over the top. Uh, uh, peak oil is a critical issue. Uh, I probably disagree that, I mean, climate change is, is happening concurrently, so not one or the other. And it does add, particularly in this region, enormous weight to the argument about investing in uh, rail. Next question. Yes. <coughs> how, how significant do you think population change, particularly the ageing of uh, the population into regional communities and their planning priorities? Yeah. Look, the, if the demographic profile, I think it's very significant. Um, uh, certainly in the case of Europe and Delta, if you look at the demographics, you know, there's this uh, sort of goes like that. It's an uh, uh, age group between uh, 18 to 30. It's just gone. And then uh, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, aged population. Now, in Yorubadala, if you think of uh, the pattern of uh, coastal uh, growth on our south coast, taking a local example, it's basically a linear, linear pattern that's spread out. Now, financing infrastructure on that kind of pattern of urban development, I'm coming to answer your question, is very, very problematic. And also, from a community perspective, they want one of each, you know, like a swimming pool in each of those towns. In fact, the biggest argument down there has been about the regional hospital. So the pattern of urban development on our south coast has not helped. Uh, the ageing demographic, I'm very concerned about issues like isolation, access to services. Uh, if you're somebody who is not able to drive a car anymore, or don't wish to drive a car anymore, uh, the options for public transport are negligible. So I think there's, it's a problem already. The nature of the pattern of development has exacerbated that, and an ageing demographic is going to Very similar. Question over here. Uh, yeah, Barbara, I, you know, I have to say I'm, I'm a big fan of um, trains. I love them, love riding on them, love looking at them, etc. I love railways. But I do remember in the 70s when all the train lines got you know, taken away because it costs more to, to freight people and, and things by, by train. And I just wonder what it's going to take to get that investment. Is it a matter of the government just putting its foot down and taking that kind of 
microeconomic view out of the equation and saying we have to have trains? Oh, that's a really good question. I, uh, well, maybe it is that. Maybe it is. It does come back to leadership in that sense. But also, uh, as Will knows, I'm, I'm becoming more and more interested in our cost-benefit analysis around these issues. Part of pricing that people help with that. But uh, I think, and the OECD, <coughs> who I have connections with, uh, uh, definitely are beginning to look at this. So, you know, I think until we uh, change our <coughs> economic modelling to look at the social, economic and environmental components in a real way and cost those, it's very hard to get the economic out. So, in the absence of that, it requires an issue. Uh, but I, I, from what my understanding, that is changing. I think in the ACT, they're looking at uh, green accounting, some of those issues, from what I understand. Uh, certainly at, at the Commonwealth level, I know in Treasury, they're looking at those issues. So maybe, maybe it, it bodes well for the future. Uh, but uh, until, we, until we mount those arguments in a more holistic way, it's very hard to get those arguments out of the way. Um, so we need to argue for that. There's a question over here, yes. Mm. Barbara, thanks for your talk. It was very interesting. I'm interested, this is a sort of one minute <coughs> lift conversation question. You talk about the regional spatial plan uh, and the potential for that I think is incredible. Uh, from your point of view, who would you see as the key players involved and the necessary key steps to actually get that happening? Again, a good question. I, look, I do think and I'm not squibbing out of it. I do think it varies from region to region. There's one thing I've learnt, and if you'd asked me in my 20s, I would have said, that's it, that's it, black and white, finish. I knew everything in my 20s, believe me. <laughs> I think that I've learnt a little bit along the way, and that possibly it uh, 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 depends on the region. I, but I can, in a meaningful way, hopefully, the Geelong 21 is a good example, where it did start with a group of like-minded people we made a commitment to make it happen. And then local government became involved. And then local go each of the local governments decided to put in not a lot of money. You know. can, you, can you imagine, in, say after tonight, this group decided to have a business special plan. You know, step one. We could do that, actually. Anyway, we reached a special plan. And then say after tonight, each local government, 16, 17, 17 local councils, contributed $20,000. And there was a bit more money coming from maybe the NCT government. Say we had 400000 to spend. We, we, we would have a regional spatial plan. <coughs> That's what it would cost. So I, I don't think, uh, and I did think about this before I came. So I walk up and down, maybe easily, some people know. They're going to ask me, what do you mean and how are you going to do it? And that's how I think we can do it. It starts with a meeting like this. You know, it's, it's like that revelation to some of my friends when we were in our 40s, I think. And we all said, well, why aren't we doing this, this and this? And then we looked at each other and we thought, well, actually, it's, we're, the, we're the decision makers now. It's actually up to us. We have to take the lead. So it is up to us. So I think it's... It's, it's, it's not complicated. It's like a group of people like this can make a decision to make it happen, a shared outcome, and, and work together and uh, bring in local government. And then, if you follow the Geelong model, the state and Commonwealth will come in. Because once they see the momentum and see it working, the politicians will definitely come in, and then the jurisdictions will come in. Do you want a motion to that effect? <laughs> <laughs> there was another question in Yes. All your plans come music to my ears. But where did dollar come from? Yes. Isn't it most of eighty most of, more than eighty percent of our income export dollars come from mining? Any more eventually in conflict of interest I mean, their own to create a job they have to have mining. And mining is against environment. So where can we stop? Well, we can stop a few things, but uh, I won't so we're jumping back to the national national scene there. Um, and this is where we do talk about a patchwork economy, and uh, Prime Minister talks about this all the time. Uh, look, I think there are real challenges. 
And I think there are some, and I'll come back to plenty of that. Something I do want to say tonight, just before we finish. There are, are decisions we have to make in the future about what we will support and what we won't support. Carbon price, in my view, my personal view, is absolutely the right direction to start sending that, that message to the industry. And this is where I'll come back to planning. Uh, the Australian, when they interviewed me in the weekend for the sea level rise feature thing they ran this weekend, we have half an hour discussion, we have one line in the paper, I love these interviews. But they, they, uh, so um, they asked me about uh, certainty and sea level rise. I said, we have my 30 years experience in planning, New South Wales, ACT, Victoria, National, has uh, brought me to the conclusion, rightly or wrongly, that industry is looking for certainty. And they are looking for certainty and they are looking for the price signals. Once you set those price signals, if you're in business, if you're on a board, they will shift, they will adapt. But what they don't like is uncertainty. And so I think whether it's uh, issues around carbon pricing or whether it's issues around planning, and this is my real point about planning, we need to have the ability to say yes or no. In planning, we have lost the ability to say no. And that's a more serious thing, probably the subject for another seminar. But in planning, we have lost the ability because we went through a phase, deregulation through the 90s, planning was not something that we uh, were allowed to mention, really. Some planners here would know that, because uh, it's seen as intervention. Uh, everything became flexible. Now, flexibility is good for innovation, but it's not good if it means anything can go. And I think that planning has lost its way in that way, and I say this is a past national president. Uh, we do need to be able to go back and be able to say, that's where you can develop for all those good reasons, based on evidence and analysis. That's where you cannot develop, because we need to retain those spaces in between the green, as I said in my presentation. Well, we are, since 1990s, you are more dependent to the mining dollars every year more. We are. You are not cutting it up. You are getting more and more no. dependent to the mining dollars. How can we fix the environment, which is in contrast with yeah. mine? Yeah. Look, I appreciate your point very much. <coughs> I'm happy to talk about it over a drink after. But I just think that, and I do, I, look, I agree with you. Uh, <coughs> but I guess I am uh, uh, hopeful with some of the recent decisions that have been made around valuing the environment, either whether it's uh, through carbon pricing or other measures that that will facilitate that transition to a clean, green future. Yes. Um, we're in Texas. I saw in the paper about a week ago, I think, um, a map of Canberra and the different parts of Canberra that would be more vulnerable to climate change. And I was wondering, um, have you had a chance to look at that or are you involved in looking at where we take that in terms of the developing um, adaptation measures? I saw that map too, and I tried to find the report, and I'm still looking for it. So, oh, right. so, so, I, so to be honest, I haven't read it. I tried to read it, but I haven't read it. And so, if anyone can help me, I'm, I'd like to. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> because I think that I was really interested to look at, at that analysis. Uh, um, I think in the role that Curve has over the next 12 months, definitely we'll, we'll be looking at that. And, uh, but I think it's a great step forward that we're starting to do our own analysis. Well, let's take a couple more questions before we talk for drinks. Tony, There's yeah. one here, and then Tony, and then one over in the corner. That's those three. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm from the community, um, regionally. Um, one, of the, one of the issues I think that's going to be difficult is communication. In other words, getting your ideas out down into the communities, and communities get those ideas back up, because we've, we've got the multi-layer, yes. and there are stops and breaks and, yes. and things of each. Have you got a, a strategy for uh, getting your ideas out fairly quickly into the community so we can have a look at them and feed back to you? Well, I could simply answer CAF, but I'll try and be more expansive than that. Uh, I think that it is early days for CAF. I mean, that's partly what CAF's about. It's about crossing those boundaries, not having to go through those traditional uh, means. And having a digital website to just even, like, put today's talk up straight away, tomorrow, is, is a way of communicating that. And, uh, but um, certainly from Kirk's perspective, um, we are looking to have, you know, this is our third uh, speaker, uh, we are looking to have regional uh, uh, speakers in our forums. 
And I'd be quite happy if we had forums in the region. <coughs> and we had a regional symposium with the department, federal department, in, um, in, uh, in Spain. Communication, uh, so I think, uh, look, it's not easy, and there's communications experts here. I'm not a communications expert, I'm a living planner, but uh, I do know enough from my own, my own experience, you need to use a whole range of media, and uh, we'll be seeking to do that. Any suggestions you have? Love to come to community. Well, the community can help. Yes, oh, absolutely. We can, <laughs> yeah. we can feed out to our communities yeah. if we have the right information. That's right. So, good, we great. Can. That's a good outcome. Um, Senator Carnot from the Department of Regional Australia, we can partly respond because we've got regional development committees everywhere and they have a role. And um, we've got our own website and we can help um, in that communication as well. But having just spoken to the New South Wales, new government in New South Wales who are interested in yeah. a discussion about the capital region and working across boundaries, what would be powerful is if the communities were Committee was organised, particularly the regional development committees and that region were interested. If they were putting a proposal up and we can help guide that, that becomes very powerful. So, where the public become very powerful is they can get all that alignment because it's much more difficult sometimes, at, you know, from a public policy point of view, having to work from the AC to government and the Commonwealth to get the alignment between the various levels of government. But if the committee already aligned, it's much easier for the governments to align. And I think that would be a fruitful conversation, which might then support the, you know, the national capital region or whatever you're calling it, um, come to fruition. Mm. Last question in the corner. Thank you. I very much enjoyed your uh, presentation too. Uh, I just wondered uh, if you were, I'm sure you are probably aware that the ACT has done a uh, state of environment report, and initially they they just did it for the ACT, but they expanded out to a regional involving, I think, some 16 shires, and I was seeing your map, I'm not sure how, I mean, it looked it's to me like they're closely aligned, yeah, it's the same. Yeah. but it sort of uh, seemed to me to make a good link to what what has been produced out of those reports and aligning it to what, obviously, you're trying to achieve on a regional sense. I'm so pleased you asked that question, because uh, Max E. Cooper, I, I spoke to Max uh, last week, and I wanted to talk about that in my talk. When I saw how long the talk was, I kind of ran out of room, or well, I thought I did anyway. Uh, there were 50 <coughs> slides originally, I cut it back to 30. Well, I think we're still worried about that. So uh, I think that, um, I, think that um, I value that work, I recognise that work, we both do. Um, we need to build upon that, and uh, we have very good uh, dialogue between uh, the three of us, in fact, between us and myself. I certainly think the cross-border issues in terms of transport are something that really need to be worked on. The figures, I'm trying to remember the figure, the figure of, someone will know, you want my students from this. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, tra the number of people who come to Canberra for jobs every day from Queenbeard, the state of 20,000 out of the workforce of something like 30,000. Like it's, it's, it's huge. Come from Queenbeard to Canberra every day. Do we have a transport plan just to cross the border? No. Well, they all drive. That would be a good start, wouldn't it? <laughs> right. It's time now to uh, retire for further discussion over some wine and dimples out in the lobby. But before we do, let's thank Barbara again for her. Uh, <laughs>